welcome back. Today we are going to talk about meeting the residents' needs for safety. So during this unit, we will talk about some different examples of resident situations that may influence safety, and we'll also identify some things that you can do as CNAs and members of the healthcare team to not only keep the residents safe, but to keep yourselves and your coworkers safe as well. So some of our residents may suffer from some impaired memory. They may suffer from confusion, forgetfulness, or faulty judgment. So what this means is some of your residents may not quite know what's going on. They might not understand that they need help to get up and go to the bathroom. They may not understand that putting their oxygen cord out in the middle of their room is a trip hazard. So they might accidentally trip over the oxygen cord. Um, they might forget where they put their walker and try to go search for it and end up falling in the process. Or they might have faulty judgment and think, oh, I don't need to use that cane today. I'll be fine. You know, I can do this on my own. I have been walking by myself for 85 years and I do not need any help. I don't need that cane. Well, there's a reason why they have the cane and they might have impaired judgment to be able to tell them, you know, that they need it. So some of our residents may also have impaired mobility. I know we've already kind of talked about mobility and how to help our residents with it, but some of our residents may be impaired due to dizziness. So if they have blood pressure issues a lot of times or pulse issues, if their blood pressure gets too high or too low or their pulse gets too high or too low, sometimes that can cause a lot of problems with dizziness and they can feel like they're just not quite right, their head's kind of spinning, so that might impair their mobility. Some people might be impaired due to tremors. Now this is where the resident kind of shakes. Not like a seizure, but they kind of shake a little bit all the time. A lot of times residents with Parkinson's will have the tremors or people that take certain medications may cause tremors as well. So they might have a lot of difficulty with this. A lot of times going along with the tremors, you might have kind of a slow shuffly gait where they, the resident can't pick up their feet off the floor and they might kind of shuffle along and kind of slide their feet along the floor. That you know promotes a huge trip hazard. So your residents may trip over things that normally, you know, like a threshold that they normally would be able to pick up their foot over, or they may just trip over their own feet. And not because they're clumsy, but because they either can't or don't know how to pick their feet up completely to clear the floor and keep them from tripping. So some of our residents may have impaired mobility due to weakness. So think about people that have just gotten out of the hospital that they may not have been out of bed a whole lot, that their muscles have kind of, you know, gotten out of shape and they're not able to move around quite as well. So weakness can definitely play a huge part in mobility issues. Also, as we get older, our reflexes are slowed. So think about when you're driving your car to work and somebody pulls out in front of you and you have to slam on the brakes. Your good reflexes and good brakes, but mainly your good reflexes of you being able to hit your foot on the brake is going to help keep you from having an accident. So some of our elders may have slowed reflexes. So say they are walking along in the hall, they get kind of dizzy, they might be kind of next to the wall, but they um, start to fall. They may not have good reflexes to maybe put their hand out to break their fall. Or they may not have the good reflexes if they get really close to that threshold. They may realize that the threshold is there after they've already kind of tripped over it. So that can make a big difference with your residents. So slowed response time kind of goes along with that slowed reflexes. So it takes a bit, little bit longer for their brain to process the fact that, oh, I need to respond to that hazard that's right in my way. So some other sensory impairments for um, your residents to stay safe. A lot of times people have impaired vision. So they may have some different clarity of the field, clarity or field of vision issues. 
Um, so they might be diminished, which means they can't see quite as well from things like macular degeneration, a brain injury, or a CVA, um, also known as a stroke. We will get into a lot of the visual changes further on in the course, but just be aware that those vision changes can really make a difference with those residents trying to be able to um, see their surroundings. So we need to make sure that it's very clear for the residents what we are able to help them with and also to make sure that they have adequate lighting. So hearing is another thing that can cause safety issues. So they may not be able to hear a warning sound. Say they are perfectly um, cognitively intact, which means they know what's going on. They know who they are, they know where they're at, they know who you are, they know what they're supposed to be doing. And a fire breaks out. Well, normally, you know, they know what's going on, they know what they're supposed to do. What if they can't hear the fire alarm? So we need to kind of think about that and make sure that your residents, that yes, even though they may know what's going on, and a lot of the other residents may be able to hear the fire alarm, but if somebody has impaired hearing, they might not be able to hear it. So you need to make sure to check on those residents as well. Also, another thing, if you have people that use the motorized scooters in your facility, a lot of times our people with hearing impairment are not going to be able to hear those scooters coming up behind them. And some of our people have a little bit of a hard time slowing down with those scooters and making sure that they're safe as well. So scooters can be another safety impairment that is prevalent in a facility that allows them, but your residents that maybe accidentally walk out in front of the scooter may not be able to hear the scooter coming, or if the person on the scooter uses a horn to notify the person, then they may not be able to hear that. So that kind of goes both ways good education um, to be had by both the person walking in front of the scooter and the person driving the scooter to make sure both people are being safe and being aware of their surroundings. So some other sensory impairments, touch and temperature, this is a big thing. Now your residents that like to take really hot baths or they like to wash their hands in super hot water, the facility is going to regulate how hot that water temperature can get. But some of our residents may think that they want it a lot hotter and they don't realize that that hot water is getting so hot that it may eventually start to hurt their skin. Or if there's an issue with the mixing valves or the water temperature regulators in the facility, some of your residents may not be able to recognize that until it's too late. Of course, we're gonna look out for that for them and kind of, you know, as we're washing our hands throughout the day, we're gonna feel that water temperature and feel that it's safe for the residents. But if you notice when you're washing your hands that the water temperature is way too hot, notify somebody immediately. Make sure that that gets taken care of and let your residents know or maybe assist them a little bit more than you might on a normal basis. Um, touch and temperature can really be a big thing with people that are at home. I know we're mainly focusing on facilities, but if you ever do go work in a home setting, touch and temperature can be a huge thing if someone is trying to cook, especially if you put that confusion or forgetfulness in there or the impaired judgment. So you may have people that have left the stove on and they go to put their hand down if they're leaning on the stove and they don't realize it's hot because they forgot that they turned the stove on and they stick their hand on the burner. Their slowed reflexes and slowed response time may cause them to have a burn because they can't feel it immediately. So kind of adding all those things together. Hopefully this will never happen to any of our people living at home, but it could. So we kind of have to be aware of that as well. So a lot of times your residents also cannot identify warning sensations of pressure in addition to the temperature changes. And don't forget about cold. People that like to go outside, people that maybe are confused and try to get out in the winter, they don't know that it's really, really cold outside. They don't know that they're walking outside maybe in their pajamas and no shoes into 30 degree weather. It's gonna take them a lot longer to feel that cold. 
that some of our residents may not be able to identify warning signs of pressure. This is why it's very, very important if we have residents that are immobile that can't feel that pressure issue going on, that we turn them. Make sure that they're clean, make sure that they're dry, keep their skin moistened, keep, you know, make sure they have adequate hydration, adequate nutrition, all of that stuff that goes along with it because they may not be able to feel when they're not getting enough circulation to a certain area of their body. So smell and taste. Some of our residents may not be able to identify those warning odors. So think about when we have talked about the residents living space and how some of our people like to hoard things, especially food. When that food goes bad, they may not be able to smell it. This again kind of goes along with the people that are going to be doing any kind of home health. Um, so if you're doing home health and you kind of smell something in the fridge and it's food that's gone bad, your resident or your client may not be able to smell it. So just kind of keep that in mind. They may not also be able to taste when something has gone bad. So if you have a resident that's hoarded a banana, it's been in there for a week, it's starting to smell, it's kind of gone rotten, then they may not be able to tell that it's rotten if they maybe have impaired vision, they maybe have, you know, impaired sense of smell, so they try to eat it. Well, it tastes just fine to them. Now they're sick. So that's why we kind of got to stay on top of things. And I know I'm going to extremes with this, but I just like to make sure that we think about that throughout your shift and make sure that you're paying attention to that. So some side effects from medications. So some of our side effects from medications may include impaired mobility and confusion, um, especially some of our drugs that deal with um, the brain with people with psychotic episodes. Some of our antipsychotic medications can cause those tremors, can cause different um, problems with being able to move your limbs or pick up your feet. Um, some medications can also cause confusion. This is why it's very, very important to know your resident's baseline or their normal functioning. So if the resident starts getting new medications and they're starting to act kind of funny, it might be the medicine. As, med as CNAs, it is not your job to know that it is the medicine's fault that's, you know, causing these problems. However, you can still be aware and, you know, be proactive. Let your nurse know or let the med aide know, hey, Mrs. Jones is not quite acting right today. She's normally pretty happy, chipper, and today she just doesn't really feel like getting out of bed. She says she's kind of sluggish. She has had trouble getting to the bathroom and wants some help. Well, she normally can take herself. So that might be a good thing to go ahead and report. Uh, maybe a cause of a medication might be something else, but report it on up the chain so that somebody can investigate that. So some different things that we can use um, to help with safety precautions and to prevent resident falls. Residents clothing. Make sure that your residents have non-slip shoes, that if they have shoelaces that they're tied, and a lot of people will go to Velcro shoes because it's a lot easier for them to put them on and off um, and not have to tie their shoes if they have trouble with moving their fingers. Make sure that robes and gowns and pants, skirts, everything that is something long that the resident wears, make sure it's not too long. If it is too long, then you might be able to talk to your charge nurse or talk to the resident's family, see if they can get the um, clothing hemmed up a little bit just so the person won't trip over it. And make sure whenever the resident is wearing their shoes as well, um, kind of going back to the shoes, that the shoes are on properly. You see the gentleman at the top of the slide that's using a shoe horn to get his foot in. That's really important to make sure that the resident's foot is properly in the shoe because if the heel is kind of bunched up underneath, uh, if the heel of the shoe is kind of bunched up underneath the heel of the foot, it can slide off very easily while somebody's walking. So we want to make sure those shoes are on properly. So some different things that you can do to help the resident in their room is always make sure the items that the resident uses frequently are kept within reach. 
the remote control, their water, their hair comb, their lipstick, their whatever it is, their urinal, and the call light. And make sure that that person not only has their call light in reach, or they can reach it very easily, but also that you answer it promptly. Because some of our residents may get frustrated and think that you're not going to come when they, when they push their call light, so they're going to stop using it. And they're going to try to take those unsafe actions that we want to try to stop them from doing. So if a resident, if you see somebody walking in their room and they really shouldn't be walking on their own, they've got it on their care plan that they need assistance, stop and assist them. Make sure that they don't fall. So make sure that you provide the needed assistance before they take an unsafe action or, you know, stop and help them when they are doing something unsafe. Make sure to provide a clear walking path through the room. So this is kind of making sure that the cords are out of the way, making sure that the um, oxygen tubing isn't on the floor, making sure that there's not papers everywhere that the person can slip on. All of those different kinds of things are going to be things that can uh, promote safety. Make sure that you also have adequate light to see where you're walking, where the resident's walking. And remember that some residents may require more light to be safe than we do because their eyes may not be working quite as well as our eyes are. If you see any spills in any walking areas, make sure that those are promptly wiped dry. This is very, very important because some residents may not be able to see that there is a spill and they may slip in it and fall. And that's a big, big safety issue. And just remember that falls are the number one cause of injury and death in a nursing home. So very, very big things to prevent falls. Of course, we want to prevent other safety issues as well. But falls are the biggest one. Make sure that your electrical devices are properly used. Now, with this, um, the Kansas State Fire Marshal has regulations and also federal regulations that you cannot use any extension cords in a nursing home. You can use an extension cord maybe for an extremely temporary project if you absolutely have to, but you should never find an extension cord in a residence room. We may have some well-meaning families that want to make sure that mom can reach everything and that she's got her favorite lamp and can't go right next to the bed or can't get plugged in right next to the bed. So they've used the cord, you know, the outlet across the room and brought in an extension cord so she can reach it no extension cords. Also, make sure that people do not have any power strips. Now, power strips can be used in a very limited way in a nursing home. They can be used for audiovisual equipment, such as TVs, DVD players, computers, um, different things like that. But power strips cannot be used for anything that has a motor. Those have to be plugged directly into the wall. So what this means is any of your electrical beds that have a motor cannot use a power strip. Any of your lift chairs that have a motor cannot use a power strip. Refrigerators or mini fridges cannot use a power strip. Anything with a motor cannot use a power strip. If you see something plugged into a power strip and you're not sure, stop and ask someone. Stop and ask your charge nurse, stop and ask another CNA, stop and ask a maintenance person, whoever you can find to ask just to make sure that it's safe and that the resident is okay to have that. Again, some well-meaning families may try to bring in a lot of things for the resident, you know, make their space pretty. We want to make mom comfortable here. It's her home. We want to have, have her have as much stuff from home as possible. That's great. However, <laughs> Sometimes our families may not understand that those power strips are not to be used. So we may need to help do some education or maybe have the charge nurse and the maintenance person talk to the family just to kind of get them to understand. So make sure you have intact electrical cords and outlets. I know I kind of went into it in the last unit about the intact electrical cords and outlets, but this is really, really important because if you keep shoving the bed up against the wall and the cord is right behind it, you're going to keep compressing that cord and bending it, eventually the casing on the outside of that cord may start rubbing off and then you have exposed wires. And if you keep hitting those exposed wires, eventually they might spark. Very, very scary thing, especially when we are around a lot of oxygen like we are in a nursing home because oxygen will spark a fire. That is the fuel for the fire. 
then you have to have the spark and then the oxygen <laughs> promotes the fuel. So make sure that if you have any electrical cords um, or outlets that are problematic, also look at your outlets and make sure that they're okay too. Then stop, don't use the equipment, and let somebody know immediately. Make sure that you use your bed rails correctly, that they're not put up on somebody to prevent them from falling out of bed, that they're used for mobility only, and no throw rugs. Now this one is something that a lot of residents have kind of some issue with because they like the throw rugs, they think they're pretty, they add some warmth to the room and add a personal touch, and that's wonderful. However, throw rugs are a big safety hazard. Ask any occupational therapist, physical therapist, or physical therapy aid, occupational therapy aid, and they will tell you no throw rugs. Even some of the ones with the um, grippy on the back, they really don't want you using throw rugs for a resident because it is a tripping hazard because a lot of people really don't have the foot clearance to get over it or they don't stop and think about getting the foot clearance over um, that rug to make sure that it's safe for them. So when you are transferring somebody from one surface to another, make sure that you use your brakes and wheel locks appropriately. So if you are putting someone from the bed to a wheelchair, make sure the bed is locked, make sure the wheelchair is locked. Because if you try to get somebody off that bed and set them in the wheelchair and the wheelchair is not locked and you don't set them down exactly right in the wheelchair, the wheelchair can start to roll backwards. And your person may be on the front of the seat and then they're gonna slip out and fall. So you want to make sure that all of your wheel locks are used appropriately when you're getting them from one surface to another, bed to wheelchair, bed to shower chair, um, you know, wheelchair back to bed, anything like that. Um, if you're using those mechanical lifts, make sure the brakes are locked. So hallways, make sure that your residents are encouraged to use those handrails. Sometimes your residents may use a cane or no assistive devices at all. They may not need anything yet. So if you've got a resident that is walking, doesn't have a walker, doesn't have a um, wheelchair or anything like that, they may be using a cane or nothing at all, they can definitely use those handrails to help keep them safe. That's what they're there for. Make sure the hallway is clear of objects. This is a big thing for the fire marshal because an object is considered stored in a hallway if it is not moved for 30 minutes. What this means is your housekeeping cart or your linen cart or wheelchairs or med cart or anything, if it's sitting in the hallway for longer than 30 minutes in the same spot, it's considered storage and that is a no-no. So if you have a linen cart that you have to keep right outside the doors, you know, to put your linens in throughout the shift, that's fine. Make sure it gets moved every 30 minutes. Also, make sure that everything that is in the hallway is on one side of the hallway. This not only will keep the fire marshal happy, but this is a huge safety issue if you have a resident that is needing to go to the hospital. The ambulance and fire personnel should not be having to play ping pong across the sides of the hall to try to get around all the stuff that's out there. So make sure that you keep all of the stuff on one side of the hall if you have to have something in the hall and make sure that it's moved every 30 minutes so that you can have you know the emergency personnel be able to get to your resident quickly and not have any problems but make sure that you assist your resident with toileting on a regular basis as needed and according to their care plan this is a good thing that will help keep residents safe because a lot of people if you don't follow the care plan of how they need to, be, need to be toileted, then they may try to do it themselves. They might start feeling the urge, you know, say you have a resident that needs to be toileted before and after every meal and at bedtime. So it's getting to be, you know, eight o'clock in the evening. They've had supper at six and they haven't gone to the bathroom. And they're starting to feel the urge. So they may try to go take themselves. So this will help a lot with um, safety. Also, the toileting as per the care plan, the care plan interventions for toileting are not there just to be fun. Those are there for a reason. And the care plan is made 
specifically for each resident to meet their needs as well as you can. So you may have people um, on a toileting plan, you know, several residents on a toileting plan, it may be completely different for each one. And that's fine because that's the point of those care plans is to tailor make them to your resident and what their needs are and to optimize um, their function. So some other hazards, um, report any resident behaviors that make them at risk for falling. So if you see somebody that's confused, if they complain that they're dizzy, um, if they insist on leaving that oxygen cord out in the middle of the room and they're like, no, I'm okay. I don't need to put it up. I'm going to be fine. Um, any other kind of something odd, you know, that might put them at risk for falling, make sure that you report that to the nurse. Report any malfunctioning equipment or any frayed cords or anything like that. So if you have a bed that, say you have a bed that you put the bed up so that you can change the resident. You go to put it back down, it won't go back down. It's stuck. You've tried unplugging and replugging the bed. You've tried putting it in a different outlet. It's still stuck. You need to report that as soon as possible and stay with that resident. Have somebody else report that you know, if you're by yourself, put your call line on, have somebody, you know, report that and stay with that resident to make sure that they don't fall out of bed since you're not able to put it back to their care plan height. So malfunctioning equipment has to be removed until it is safe. Check with your facility to see if they have any programs such as a lockout tagout program. So what a lockout tagout program is, is if you find any piece of equipment that is not working quite right, then you can put a sign on it that says lock out, tag out. And that means that no one is allowed to use that equipment until it has been fixed. And of course you're gonna report that, you know, immediately to your So some things you could do to help keep the residents safe at mealtime is to provide mealtime assistance to residents that are needing help to prevent spilling or swallowing foods or liquids that are too hot. So one of the things you can do is maybe pour their cup of coffee and, you know, tell them that it's a little too hot right now or kind of stir it or add a little bit of creamer if they like it afterwards. And that creamer might help cool it down enough to where they can drink it. Um, another thing you might do is if you have somebody that you are physically helping feed, which we will teach you how to do that as well, is that you can um, give them their cooler foods first and let their hot foods cool down so that they don't burn themselves on their food. Um, you may have to provide different types of cups. Um, they do have double handed cups with lids on it. Kind of, kind of looks like a sippy cup that you would give to a child, but they are made for adults. Um, and that will help as well to keep them from splashing anything, especially if they have tremors or difficulty holding onto the cups. And then also you can use weighted utensils and some other different features that we'll go a lot more into when we get to the nutrition chapter. So water temperature, we already kind of talked to you about that. Um, if you've got a resident that insists on getting your shower water hotter, you might make sure that you have a heat lamp on, uh, make sure that they have a towel covering them, make sure that, you know, that you're not exposing too much of them and just kind of keep in mind that a lot of people, they've lost a lot of their nerve endings so they can't feel that the water is really that hot um, and check the water on your own arm just to make sure it's not too hot. So also uh, monitor resident during the bath so that they don't change the water temperature to an unsafe level. Uh, monitor your resident's activity when they're in a food prep area where hot equipment such as steam tables are present. Now this is really important. Um, some places do use steam tables where they'll have the food already kind of made and um, they will bring the food out, put it on the steam table and hold it until they serve it. Those steam tables get extremely hot, very, very hot. And if a resident were to touch it or to get some of the steam on them, that can injure their skin very, very quickly. So a lot of places will put um, doors on little swinging doors or half doors in the food, food prep areas um, to help keep the residents out, especially the confused people. So keep an eye on people when you've got those steam tables on. 
Smoking. Now, most of your facilities are not going to allow smoking anymore, but if your facility does allow smoking, make sure that your residents are smoking only in those designated smoking areas. You may have to provide supervision for those residents if people have, you know, again, musculoskeletal disorders, if they have trouble holding on to their cigarettes, holding on to their lighters, you may have to help them. So you may have to kind of, um, you know, light their cigarette for them or just kind of keep an eye on them to make sure that they're not um, burning themselves. And the resident may also wear a protective smoke apron. Now, I don't think these are used very often anymore, but you may ask your facility if they have a smoking policy for your residents, um, whether or not they have smoking aprons that are available. So some different devices that produce heat or cold, such as a heating pad or um, a cold pack, should be used very, very carefully and monitored while in use. A lot of times facilities will not even allow heating pads into the facility, or they may allow heating pads that only go up to a certain level or that have an automatic shutoff. Because again, you have those forgetful residents that like to turn those heating pads on, it feels great, so they leave it on and they forget that it's there and it's been on for an hour and it's been directly on their skin. Now they have a burn from the heating pad. So it can happen very, very quickly with those heating pads. And if you have any kind of heat or cold that you're needing to provide to somebody such as a heating pad or a cold pack, you need to make sure there's another layer of fabric between. So a lot of times um, with a cold pack, you may have to wrap a towel around it or a heating pad, a pillowcase or something like that, just to make sure that there's not direct contact with the skin or that it's not going through um, thin material like a t-shirt or, you know, a gown or something like that. So like we've kind of learned before, make sure that you report any of those malfunctioning equipments, faulty plugs or outlets or frayed cords immediately. Um, get them taken care of so that your residents and your other staff and yourself don't get hurt. Um, also follow your facility electrical safety policy. So if you have that lockout tagout program for malfunctioning equipment, that may be part of it. And also some places require that electrical equipment has to be checked by maintenance before use. So this is different than that lockout tagout. Because if you have somebody that brings something in brand new to the facility and it's never been used before, maintenance may want to check it out for safety just to make sure it's going to be okay. So one thing that comes to mind is um, in assisted living, I had a lady that was pretty alert and oriented. She knew what was going on. She got around pretty well in her room and her daughter called me one day and said, I want to buy mom a, Keur a Keurig machine for Christmas. Can I buy that for her? So I checked with my maintenance department and I checked with my administrator and, you know, they said, well, yeah, that's fine. As long as it's got some kind of shutoff switch and that, you know, it's got some kind of spill tray. That way, if it overflows by accident, that it's not going to cause an electrical fire. So that was fine. So I called her daughter back and I said, yeah, you can buy it. Um, just make sure it's got those safety features and then we'll have to have maintenance check it out before she can actually use it. So she did. She brought it into the facility, maintenance checked it out, and they said, yeah, this is fine for her to use. And um, our lady was able to make her cappuccinos every morning in her apartment and she really loved it and that was a great gift for her. So we were able to work together with her family and with maintenance to make sure to get that to her but make sure it was safe as well. So some other safety precautions that you need to take. Chemicals are a big thing. So if you see an unlabeled container, assume that an unlabeled bottle or container contains harmful material and do not use it. Do not put it anywhere where the residents can use it either. A lot of places will not even allow the big jars of hand sanitizer to be left out because residents may try to drink it if they're really confused. Now those don't have a whole lot of alcohol in them. You know, yes, they're alcohol based hand sanitizers and it would take basically drinking an entire gallon to get somebody impaired, but that can still be kind of harmful to the residents, especially um, since they can't handle as much of those impairment substances as other people might. So if you see those unlabeled containers, stop, don't use them. Take it to your housekeeping person, take it to your maintenance supervisor, take it to your charge nurse, whoever you have, just do not use that. So 
if you have a label that is on your container, this will give instructions for safe use of contents. So this will tell you, you know, what's in it and how to use it. So make sure that you follow that label's instructions because some of your, um, some of your substances may be concentrated and they need to actually be diluted before you can use them. So a lot of your cleaning products will be like that. Um, bleach products or floor cleaners or um, cleaning products in a kitchen area, those things need to be diluted. So please pay attention to all of your labels as you are getting oriented to your facility where you're going to work. They should be teaching you how to use those things, but just in case you come across something that you're not familiar with, stop, read the label first, and make sure that you look at everything. So some harmful substances, all of your potentially harmful substances should be kept in a lock cabinet when not in use. Now, when you're using those, when the staff's using it, you're fine to keep it unlocked, but anything that could be potentially harmful needs to be locked up when it's not in use to keep it out of resident and the resident's way and to keep them from harm. So some potentially harmful substances um, include a lot of things that we wouldn't think that would be potentially harmful, like liquid soaps or shampoos, some topical skin medications, which those shouldn't be left out anyway, nail polish and nail polish remover. Because again, we have some of those confused residents that may try to drink it. They might try to put it in their eye, uh, put it on their skin. I know, again, I'm kind of going to extremes, but you always have to kind of think worst case scenario with safety and think, okay, what can possibly happen to my resident? And how do I need to kind of cut it off before it does happen? So keep that in mind. So the last thing um, that we'll kind of talk about is the material safety data sheet. Now these have been updated. They will still say MSDS in your book and that's why we have it this way on the slide, but these have been updated to just MDS. Now these are um, sheets that are kept for any chemicals in the workplace and these will describe safe use and first aid measures. So on these MDS sheets, these are gonna have what kind of precautions you need to take what will happen you know if you get it on your skin on in your eyes if you ingest it or swallow it um, so those mds sheets are going to have that mds sheets uh, the reason why they changed them is because now the symbols and how the mds sheets are laid out are universal so you can go anywhere in the country and find an mds sheet and be able to identify what's on it based on the layout and what the symbols are. Now, I'm not gonna go into you know what exactly all they mean, so just kind of be aware that that's what the MDS sheets are for. So these are gonna be available for any kind of chemical in your facility, down to the alcohol pads. Alcohol pads are considered a chemical, so they have to have an MDS sheet. So make sure that you know where your MDS sheets are kept. This may be a question that a surveyor may ask you. If you are using some of those chemicals, such as the alcohol pads, the nail polish remover, the liquid soaps, if you help in a kitchen area and you've got cleaning products, all of those things will have MDS sheets. So you need to know where those are kept. That should be part of a tour whenever you enter into a new facility and when you're getting trained, but that's a good thing also to ask. So some different precautions Let's talk about oxygen. There should be a sign posted outside of every resident's room when their oxygen is in use. Now this does not mean just when the oxygen canister is on or when the concentrator is on. This means if they have oxygen in their, in their room and there's a potential that they could be using it at any time. So there needs to be some kind of sign outside the room that says oxygen in use, no smoking. And it'll have a little picture of a cigarette with the circle and the line through it. So you want to limit any situation that might start a fire because oxygen supports combustion. Like just like I was talking about with the frayed cords, if you have those frayed cords and you get them to spark and you've got oxygen there, that can definitely fuel fire. So no smoking or open flame. Some of your residents may try to get away with smoking inside. <laughs> So make sure that you report that to the charge nurse immediately. So also check with the charge nurse before using electrical equipment while the resident is receiving oxygen because some of those electrical equipment can up the static electricity that will also spark fire. 
um, make sure that you follow your facility policies. So follow your facility policy about how the oxygen um, needs to be stored, how the oxygen needs to be started, you know, all of those good stuff. Um, some places may have policies where if somebody is on oxygen, they will have a humidifier because sometimes when the air gets really dry, like it does in Kansas a lot in the summer, then the static electricity is going to increase and that is going to be more potential to start a fire when you have oxygen. Another safety thing is clothing for your residents with oxygen. Uh, try to avoid nylon clothing or maybe more of that polyester clothing. Try to stick with cotton because the cotton is less likely to make a spark. I've never seen anybody's clothes just combust from them wearing them and having oxygen on, but that is another safety precaution that you can take. The last safety precaution you can take with oxygen, no petroleum products, no Vaseline, no petroleum jelly. Don't stick those anywhere near the oxygen source. So if you have somebody that they say, well, my nose is really dry or my lips are really dry from this oxygen, let me just put some Vaseline on. No, 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 no. That needs a big problem because again, the petroleum in those products can spark a flame or it can fuel that fire if it starts. So you really don't want your resident's face to light on fire. We want to avoid that as much as possible. So there's some different products out there. There's saline nasal gel and then also some different lip moisturizers that do not contain petroleum or petroleum jelly in them or Vaseline. So just really, really stay away from that. So oxygen flow rate, this is a big important thing um, to make sure that the oxygen is on at the ordered flow rate. So if you have a concentrator and we can show you the concentrators either at the school or you'll see them at clinicals and we'll go a lot more into the oxygen um, in a later chapter but oxygen is ordered at liters per minute so if you see in a care plan that someone has oxygen at 2 l slash m i n that's two liters per minute so you want to make sure that on that oxygen concentrator or the canister that it is set at two if it is not set at two, if it's set at something different, notify your charge nurse immediately. CNAs are not allowed to change or adjust oxygen flow rate settings. So that is the nurse's job to be able to do that. Someone may have care planned, you know, two to five liters per minute per comfort, then that's up to the nurse how much that they want to do. So always follow your facility policy and just know it is not your job to determine how much oxygen someone is supposed to be on. If you see that someone is saying, I'm really short of breath or short of air, um, they probably won't tell you that. They'll say, well, I can't breathe. I can't get any air. And you look at their oxygen and their oxygen is turned on to 0.5 and they're ordered for three liters. Yeah, you can set it back to the prescribed rate because you're not changing anything that's going on with that resident, but you can set it back to the prescribed rate. Tell your nurse immediately. That way, just in case the resident accidentally knocked into it or something else happened, and that way the nurse can kind of check with the resident and make sure that they're doing okay um, and that there weren't any bad consequences from having the oxygen too low. Now, some residents may also turn their oxygen too high. So if you have people with COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Um, it's a lung disease where people have a hard time getting air in, getting air out. So they feel like they're short of breath all the time. They can't get any air, you know, they can't breathe. Sometimes those people will take their oxygen canisters or their concentrators and turn it up because they can't breathe and they think more oxygen is the answer. A lot of times with those residents, it's not, and I won't get quite into that in this lecture, but um, they will feel the need and feel like it's something that will help them feel better. So they might turn up their oxygen, let the nurse know so that they can take care of it. So when you're storing your oxygen tanks, oxygen tanks need to be stored upright and they need to be stored in a holder. So this means you cannot just take an oxygen tank and toss it on the floor and have it fall over. Because if they fall over, 
some of those can actually start um, leaking a whole lot of oxygen and again start a fire or fuel a fire so you want to make sure they're stored upright so they're standing upright all of your empty oxygen tanks and your full oxygen tanks need to be stored separately they can be stored in the same room but it needs to be clearly marked which ones are empty which ones are full and when you have those um when you have those in the same room or when you have them even in separate rooms sometimes your facility will want them um, chained as well just to make sure that they don't fall over out of the holders but just make sure that you do not store any oxygen on the floor it is stored upright it is stored separate from each other so empties and fulls are in separate racks or in separate holders and that you don't let it fall over so some more safety things these kind of go back into what we've already talked about with food um, make sure that you give the food and liquids in a form that they can handle um, kind of use those two handle cups if you need to with the lids another thing you can do is cut it up um, some residents may have to have their food ground or chopped some may need to have thickened liquids this is a safety issue not just a nutrition issue so you want to make sure that you pay attention to the person's care plan and their diet and see okay what kind of diet are they on do they need to have um, what's called mechanical soft diet which again we'll get into diets in another chapter but if they have a mechanical soft diet for example then they will have ground meat a lot of the times because they're not able to chew and swallow the whole chunks of meat so they may have to have that meat already pre-ground for them they may have to have thickened liquids so this means that if they want a glass of water they just can't get a glass of water out of the tap and drink it they have to have a certain powder um, put into it that will make the liquid a little bit thicker and that actually makes it a lot easier for them to swallow again we'll get into that in another um, lecture but just know that's not only a nutrition issue and following the care plan it's also a safety issue so what do you do if a resident starts choking how do you tell so you want to observe some, for some different symptoms of partial or complete airway obstruction now what the guy is doing in the picture is he's putting both of his hands around his throat that is the universal sign for choking if you're choking and you're panicking you may not think to put your hands around your throat and show the universal sign for choking so a lot of times your first clue that a resident is choking is when they stop speaking they're not going to be able to breathe they're not going to be able to talk well, yes yeah, speaking they're not going to be able to talk um, they may start turning colors on their face they might turn red they might turn purple their lips may turn blue so this is a serious medical emergency absolute emergency so in order to complete or to um, get rid of an airway obstruction you need to perform an abdominal thrust which used to be known as the Heimlich maneuver so we will teach you this in skills lab exactly how to do this but just in general if you take one fist or one hand and wrap it around from behind around the residents midsection put a fist on their belly and wrap your other hand around and grab your fist then turn your fist up and out to where your thumb is resting against their belly and your pinky is facing away from them then use your hands and push in and up in and up and what this will do is to cause the diaphragm in the person's abdominal cavity to push up on the lungs and push all the air out of the lungs and hopefully force whatever it is that they're choking on out of their airway so keep doing that in and up in and up when you would stop doing this as if the object flies out of their mouth hopefully it won't fly but if it comes out and they start breathing or if they pass out completely so just kind of keep in mind that people have to have oxygen in order to stay awake and conscious and after so long if their brain doesn't have oxygen it's going to shut off and they're going to pass out so if you have somebody that passes out get them on the ground and then you may perform abdominal thrusts or start cpr 
So cardiopulmonary resuscitation, um, doing chest compressions, things like that. So follow your facility policy with this. And of course, you're not going to be doing this, you know, hopefully all by yourself. You're going to have somebody else go get the nurse or go get somebody that can help you as well. So this is a situation, you know, we usually tell people try to be quiet during your shift. Don't make a whole lot of noise. This is a situation, make as much noise as you can and get somebody there to help you because you want to make sure that that resident is safe. So once that person has had the object come out of their mouth um, or come out of their airway, then you can lay them down and kind of turn them on their side. That way, just in case they have any um, secretions or saliva or anything else that comes out of their mouth that they're not going to choke on it again and cause it to go down into their lungs because that would be very, very bad. So get them on their side, on the ground, maybe get a pillow underneath their head. And a lot of times um, your nurse may have already, you know, called 911 and had EMS come out and make sure that the person's okay. Sometimes they may go to the hospital, sometimes they may not. But you're going to see this um, in people that have difficulty swallowing. So kind of pay attention to your residents of how they swallow. So if they, you see that a resident is having difficulty swallowing, they're having a hard time getting their bites down. They might kind of say stuff gets stuck in their throat um, when they eat, or they might need to take multiple swallows of liquid between each bite. That would be a great time to let your nurse know and say, Hey, do you think maybe they need a speech therapy evaluation? So we're trying to, we're trying to avoid people from choking, of, of course, in the first place, but also we just kind of taught you what you need to know just in case they do. And we will go over this in skills lab and make sure that you're um, aware of how to do these things. So let's talk about fire safety. I know I've kind of already talked about the Kansas state fire marshal's office and trying to keep them happy. Um, one of the ways that we can do that is follow the proper procedures. If a fire does break out. Now I do have some different um, documents and video after this presentation talking about fire safety, such as what the fire drill report looks like. So you're going to be having fire drills in your facility um, probably every month, but they're required at least every two months. Um, and you're never going to know when they're supposed to happen. They can't pull the fire alarm at the same time every time. And if you do work night shift, no, they will not pull the fire alarm and wake up all your residents at night, those that do actually sleep at night. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. They're not going to torture your residents and wake them up in the middle of the night for a fire drill. But the things that we need to talk about right now are race and pass. Now, race is our acronym that we use as part of the fire emergency response plan to get people safe. So there's a fire that breaks out. It's in room 102. Mrs. Jones is in there and she's had a fire break out in her wastebasket because she was sneaking a cigarette in there. Well, whatever the cause is, but there's a fire in her wastebasket. You kind of see smoke, um, smell smoke coming from her room. First thing you're going to do is you're going to rescue her. So remove any residents that are in immediate danger. If you can reach her safely, so if she is between you and the fire, or if you can go around the fire in the wastebasket and get her and get her to safety, absolutely do that. The next thing is to alert. Now this is something that can be going on simultaneously to the rescue. So you can have you going into the room to rescue Mrs. Jones and tell your other CNA or CMA or a nurse or whoever, Go pull the fire alarm. There's a fire in room 102 and announce it overhead. So alert is activating the fire alarm and letting others know about the fire emergency. A lot of places will have you page overhead and say either code red or Dr. Red room 102, Dr. Red room 102, Dr. Red room 102. That way they make sure everybody can hear it. Everybody's going to show up with fire extinguishers and, you know, want to help. That's the point of the fire you know, that's what we practice during the fire drill. And that's the point of why. So you've gotten Mrs. Jones out of her room. Somebody's pulled the fire alarm. Then you want to confine or contain. So an example is to isolate the fire by closing the doors and the windows. So if the waste baskets in there, you've gotten Mrs. Jones out, close the door. 
um, the if the fire is too big for you to put it out, close the door. So the fire doors in your corridors or in your hallways will close automatically when that fire alarm is activated. So normally your fire doors will stay open, but when that fire alarm is activated, there is um, it's tied into your fire alarm system and the fire doors will automatically shut. Those magnets will not work anymore and the doors are gonna shut. So that's why we need to keep them clear. Keep the fire doors clear at all times and don't go through the fire doors unless you absolutely have to if they're shut. So the last thing is extinguish or evacuate. So you can put out that wastebasket fire if it's still small enough, use your fire extinguisher if it's safe to do so. The facility sprinkler system will also help extinguish and you also want to remove residents to safety as part of this facility evacuation plan. A lot of times what you'll do is just get those residents on that hall beyond the fire door if it's a small enough fire. If it be, gets to be a big enough fire, you may have to evacuate the building. So know where your fire exits are. Again, this will be something that will be part of your orientation, but every facility is going to have their fire exit plan posted on the wall. So you need to know and your visitors need to know and your residents need to know where they're supposed to go in the event of a fire. One quick thing that I will say about the facility's fire sprinkler system before we move on to pass is the facility fire sprinkler system will only work if it is unobstructed. So if you have a facility, a sprinkler head that's in a resident's closet, that resident's belongings cannot be less than 18 inches from the fire head, from the fire extinguisher or sprinkler head. So what that means is 18 inches in any direction from that sprinkler head, you have to maintain open space. A lot of places will put red tape or some kind of indicator, especially in closets, to tell people, okay, don't stack anything up above this line. This is 18 inches from the sprinkler head. And if you stack anything closer, it's not gonna work. Because the way those fire sprinklers work is they will spray out and down, not just straight, you know, straight down, they're going out and down in a fan pattern. So if they have stuff kind of stacked up all the way up to the sprinkler head or too close, those objects are going to get the water instead of letting the water fan out like it's supposed to. So that's a really big thing to kind of keep in mind. Again, our well-meaning family sometimes will bring mom in new clothes and kind of put the old stuff up. And sometimes people just don't pay attention or they don't remember that they need to um, keep the fire sprinkler heads unobstructed. So the other thing that we're gonna do in the event of a fire is we're going to pass. Now this is if you are able to use a fire extinguisher. Know where your fire extinguishers are in your facility. When you all go to clinicals, pay attention to where they are. Take a mental inventory of it. So you need to know where all of your um, fire extinguishers are in your facility. So what are you gonna do with a fire extinguisher? Pull the pin. There's a little pin, it kinda looks like a grenade pin. But pull the pin out. Aim the nozzle towards the base of the fire. Squeeze the handle to start the flow of the extinguishing material and sweep from side to side at the base of the fire. If you aim above the fire, it won't do any good. You need to start from the base of the fire. So pull the pin, aim the nozzle to the base of the fire, squeeze the handle and sweep side to side. And we will have a video on that just to kind of show you guys. And then you will also get to kind of look at a fire extinguisher um, during your skills lab. So evacuating the building. Now you can have evacuations for different reasons. You can evacuate because of fire. You can evacuate because of a chemical spill. You can evacuate, you know, if there's a bomb threat, whatever it is. So evacuate the building if you're directed to use so. Use residents' beds and wheelchairs if possible and use evacuation carries to remove non-mobile residents from a fire area if other safer means are not available. So this means that you may have to do a blanket drag. So you may have to get your resident out of their bed onto the floor onto a blanket and drag them. Make sure that if you have to go down any stairs that you lift the resident's head up while you are dragging them down the stairs. You do not want their head to hit the stairs. If you are having to do the blanket drag by yourself, 
and you had to carry them down the stairs, it is better for their feet to hit the stairs than their head. You can also do a hip carry or a pack strap carry. Um, these are probably not going to be used very often. And then you can also do a chair carry or an extremity chair, extremity carry um, where you get underneath the resident's thighs and then underneath their shoulders to carry them out. So whatever your facility is wanting you to do, then just follow their, um, follow their procedure for that. So one of the things that I do want to point out as well, that's kind of on the left side of the, of the slide is not only to follow your facility emergency plan, know the plan prior to emergency. The best time to plan for an emergency is before it happens. So be aware of what your role is supposed to be. During especially a fire drill, certain duties may be assigned to certain people. So say you are CNA 2 and you are working with CNA 1, yourself CNA 2, you have a CMA and a nurse. So your nurse may be the person that's kind of the incident commander and they're going to be the person receiving a head count from the facility because um, CNA1 may be assigned to do the head count. They're going to go around and see, okay, we've got so many people, you know, all of our residents are accounted for. We maybe have a couple out of the building, but right now everybody else is on the floor. We know where they are. So you may be responsible for turning off the air handlers in a facility. So that's something that during your facility um, orientation that you'll learn about, if that's your responsibility, is turning off the air handlers. So this means shutting down the ventilation system so that the oxygen is not being carried to the source of the fire and making it bigger. Um, then your CMA may be responsible for getting all of the emergency lanyards together. So at your facility, there should be um, pictures of the residents and listings of who their doctor is, what kind of medications they take, what kind of medical conditions they have, um, and they're in a little lanyard pack that can go around their neck. So that way if you do have to evacuate the building or if you have some kind of a disaster and the emergency responders have to come, then they're going to be able to identify the residents and know what it is that they need. And this is just going to be basic things. You're not going to have your full-on care plan in there, but at least what we need to do for this person to help them survive. So some different safety measures, tornadoes. We all know what tornadoes are like in Kansas. I know some of you may not, but most of us know what tornadoes are like in Kansas. So remember, when you're working at your facility and there is a tornado warning, this is not like at home where you're going to go out in the backyard and watch the sky and look at the cool twisty things up there. I know some of us do that, but um, your responsibility at work is for your residents. So always, always, always follow your facility emergency plan make sure that you get to a safe area. You want to make sure that you have the most inner, the most internal um, windowless area that you can. A lot of times this will be in a hallway and protect the residents from flying broken glass. So if you see that there's nasty weather coming, which you should have a weather radio on all the time anyway, pay attention to the weather. If you see there's nasty stuff coming, uh, maybe there's really bad wind, there's hail, we're not yet at a tornado warning, you might encourage your residents to come out in the hall or shut their blinds at least, get them away from the windows. Well, then that tornado warning has sounded, the sirens are going off, you need to get everybody out of their room. So try to get everybody out of their room, have their windows shut or their blind shut, um, have them bring a blanket and a pillow out into the hall and maybe a wheelchair or a walker or a chair or something they can sit on and then shut their door. This will be really, really important if you have flying debris, such as if the windows get broken out. Then those doors will help prevent all of the glass from coming into the hall. And then if you do have an area that has glass in your hallway, but that's the only place you can go, you can use those pillows and blankets to help protect your residents from that flying glass. So just kind of keep that in mind. And again, always follow your facility policy but it's a good thing to kind of keep that common sense in mind and, you know, protect your residents from the flying glass. So follow your facility emergency plans um, for the rest of these 
different emergencies. I'm not going to go a whole lot into these because they are going to be kind of specific to your facility, but if you have a chemical spill, what to do? Generally, you would evacuate the building if it's big enough. Um, if you have any threat of violence or any violent stuff going on, if you have a prolonged power outage, and a lot of places um, will have generators. Assisted livings are not exactly required to have generators, but most of the nursing homes are. So if there's a prolonged power outage, what's going to happen? If there's a prolonged disruption of water supply, all of your facilities will have to have a certain amount of water on hand, um, not only for people to drink, but to cook with. You know, we still have to feed people, even if there's a natural disaster that goes on or a disaster that goes on. Um, also what to do in the event of a flood. So just make sure that you know what you're supposed to do in these situations. And yes, you may forget because kind of, it's kind of one of those things, if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you're not dealing with disasters every day, which I hope you're not, then you may not remember what you're supposed to be doing with this. So it's a good thing from time to time, if you have a few spare minutes, go find your policies and procedure book because that's where these will be listed is in your policy and procedure book and look them up. Remind yourself, okay, well, it's tornado season. It's, you know, April. We haven't had anything go on since October. It's been a little while. I can't quite remember. So let me go look at the policy and procedure book and see what I'm supposed to do in the event of a tornado. So that would be a really, really good thing to do. Um, some facilities may also have a separate disaster manual that will have these specific policies in them. So just know where your um, facilities policies are located. Generally in the fa fa facility policy and procedure book, sometimes in your disaster manual. So elopement. This is another type of big safety issue. So elopement is any resident with impaired decision-making ability that is unable to judge their own safety needs that leaves a safe area or the facility without staff supervision. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that even if the resident is technically in your building, they still can be considered having an elopement from your area. So say you are an assisted living attached to a nursing home and you have a resident that's, you know, follow somebody out the door from the assisted living into the nursing home. They are not identified, you know, staff is not with them. Staff doesn't know where they're going. The resident may not know where they're going. They didn't use a sign out procedure, which a lot of places will have to just kind of say, okay, I'm going over to the nursing home. This is where I'll be. This is what time I'm signing out. They don't do that. And they follow somebody out the door they are technically considered to have eloped from the assisted living area because they are separate licensed areas. So just kind of keep that in mind. Generally, it means when somebody leaves a facility and goes outside. So even if they're still on your grounds, if they step foot out the door without staff supervision or staff knowing where they're supposed to be going or like family taking them, that's considered an elopement. This is an immediate call to the state. This is a state investigation and you'll have to fill out um, a state witness form saying, you know, what knowledge you have of the elopement, when you last saw the resident, what you did to help prevent the elopement or what you can do in the future, um, what you did immediately after you noticed that the resident had eloped and so on and so forth. So your facility will teach you how to do all of this paperwork um, if you do have an elopement or something that needs to be called into the state. It's to the, the state hotline. So the abuse, neglect, exploitation hotline that we kind of already talked about earlier in the course, um, any elopement needs to be called into the state hotline. So one of the things that you can do as CNAs is identify residents at risk. These are going to be people that are confused. These are going to be people that want to go home, people that don't understand why they're there, people that are trying to push on the doors. And just remember that just because somebody has not been previously identified as being an elopement risk doesn't mean that they aren't an elopement risk. Now, this is a team effort. This is not just a CNA job. This is everyone's job. So your facility may identify these people on admission or throughout their stay and figure out some kind of way to kind of flag them as being an elopement risk. Um, certain facilities will use a certain color on the resident or on the resident's um, mobility devices to identify them as being an elopement risk. So some places will have yellow tape on walkers or wheelchairs 
or if somebody is independently mobile and doesn't use an assistive device, then they may have yellow shoelaces or they may wear a yellow sweater, something like that. That's just an example from one facility. So just follow whatever your facility policy is and you will be oriented to that. So all of your facility entrances and exits are monitored electronically unless under direct visual monitoring. So this does not mean all of the places will have cameras on the exits but they'll have those keypads, they'll have some kind of um, coding device. Some places use little um, coded buttons or disks to let you in and out if you, you know, need to get out and, or punch in a number to get out. So some of your residents may figure out um, how to put in the code they know how to put in the code, but once they leave that door, they don't know where they're going. So if you kind of notice that, it may be trying to change the code if they figured it out. So your resident's care plan may have specific interventions for wandering behaviors. Those people that are kind of confused, maybe a person that thinks it's 1960, they need to go get their kids off the bus stop. You know, they're trying to get out the door. They don't understand that, you know, their kids are grown. They're in a facility, they're confused, they don't need to be going outside, you know, it's, it may be three o'clock in the afternoon, but it's the middle of winter and it's 20 degrees outside and snowing. So you may have specific interventions that are in your care plan, such as, you know, at 2.45, start doing something to distract them. Do an activity, you know, take them for a walk, do something to keep their mind from going to the fact that it's three o'clock and it's time to go get the kids off the bus stop. So just follow the care plan, whatever those behaviors uh, may be and whatever the interventions are in place. If those interventions are not working, please tell somebody because there's no way to make them better if um, the interventions are not working and you keep doing the same thing and it's not working, not working, not working, not working. That's not really doing anybody any good. So just let somebody know. So your doors may have audible alarms or send a signal to a pager when they're open and some of your residents will know exactly how long and how hard to push those doors to get them to open to get outside. They do not care about the alarms. Yes, they're annoying. They want to get outside and they know how to get around it. So immediately respond when such an alarm is triggered. Don't just assume that somebody else is going to go get it. If you hear that alarm, poke your head out the door, make sure that a resident hasn't gotten out and maybe ask around and say, Hey, who set the alarm off? Was it you know, a family member that may have done it by accident, what's going on, just to make sure that your resident is still inside and safe. So an alarm cannot be reset until the triggering cause is identified. So if you hear that alarm and you poke your head out and you see, oh, well, yeah, it's their family member that's just leaving. Okay, that's fine. And you know that, you know, it's just a family member, it's not the resident, then, then you can reset the alarm. But don't just walk up to the door and reset the alarm unless you physically saw the person causing the alarm trigger walk out the door. So if a resident is missing, follow your facility's emergency plan. A lot of times this is going to be searching the facility, looking in all the rooms, looking in all the bathrooms, looking in the activity areas, the chapel, you know, wherever you can think of and doing a perimeter search. So going outside to find that person. Um, I once had a gentleman that like to go outside and he knew exactly how hard and how long to push the door and um, to get around the coding system. All he wanted to do was go outside and lay in the grass. He was a happy, happy man once he got to do that. So we, you know, he got out one time and we knew where he went because we um, were able to get outside immediately after he went out. We saw him and he walked over to the grass and laid down in the grass because that's just what he wanted to do. So we knew we had followed the plan and gone outside to find him. You know, we knew he was outside because we saw him right after somebody popped their head out the door, but we followed the facility's emergency plan. So make sure that you know what your facility's emergency plan is ahead of time and know what your um, role is going to be with that. So this concludes our safety presentation. I hope that you have found this informative. Um, if you have any questions, please contact your instructors and we will go through a lot of these things in the skills lab, especially the fire safety things, um, and maybe talk a little bit more about elopement. So bring any questions that you have and I hope that you have a great day. Thanks.